I want to invite you to close your eyes for just a minute. Where are you at? You hear that music, what do you think? Yep, how's my team going to do this year, right? What about this one? Where are you at? Yep, can you, you see the fireworks, you, you, you see the parade? Did anyone feel like it got a few degrees colder listening to that? You can open your eyes now. I was at the Bavir homecoming this week, that's why I missed the lunch uh, Friday, I apologize, but I was down at the Bavir homecoming and we built a float, and I say float, what I really mean is a 10 foot tall carriage, right? We PVC pipe and, and hula hoops and garland beyond count, beyond measure, and um, I got done walking along the parade next to this amazing float, and we were sitting down at the end of it, and I'm hot, and I'm sweating, and uh, something had gone wrong, and I had to, before, and so I had to go out there with fishing line, all these floats are held together by fishing line and duct tape, and so we're getting it all resorted so that everything is square, and I'm tired, right? and I sit down, and the kids are running, and the band is up there doing their sound check, and the guitar is just plucking along in its sound check, and it started playing, do 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 boo do 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 boo do and that's it, like the first Noel, and it feels like it got 10 degrees cooler, you just close your eyes and, man, it's Christmas, it's in August, right? It's, it's very, but you hear those notes and you have those associations. We have these, these sort of built-in associations that, that we have, and I, I use music to help you connect to them. Uh, I could have used other things as well. We have smells too, right? The, the smell of the first cut grass in the spring, first time you cut, cut the grass. Ah, it's not spring till you smell that. Or tastes, right? For me, uh, it's not Christmas till I taste my mom's cream to mint brownies. And they're, they're about that much brownie, and then about that much frosting on top of it with, with the, that cream, this pours in the cream de menthe and then the top frosting is uh, bu uh, chocolate chips melted into cream and you just pour that and it's just, it's, the brownies are amazing. Right? I wish I, I had the time and ability uh, to bring pans of those brownies for you to share this morning just so you can know, like this, for me, the taste of Christmas is that, that brownie. Right? We have these uh, connections, and it's not like we have to think about them at all, is it? We, we have those connections. As soon as we hear stars and stripes, everyone sits up a bit straighter, right? As soon as, as you uh, taste that brownie, you know it's Christmas. They're just sort of baked in, if you'll forgive the horrible pun. We're going to go back to... Um, the first century Corinth, and we're going to deal with one of their sort of associations, and it's going to take a little bit of time for, for us to, to get to the point where you can understand their associ this association, because it makes as much sense to us as if I went back and played the NFL theme to them, right? Because if you don't understand football, you're not going to understand the NFL theme. So let, let's look at Corinth for a minute, and we'll start to figure out what is their hang-up around having a stake. Right? For them to have a stake is far more than to have a stake. But we've got to get in some background before we can do that. Corinth was this a central city in, in the ancient Mediterranean. And it's one of those things that's best explained with a map. If you could go to the next slide. Uh, 
people would, would go around the Mediterranean in little small uh, ships to with trade, right? And so they would go around the Mediterranean and, and right there, I'm not tall enough, right there under Greece is, is Corinth, right? And, and so go to the next slide. You see where Corinth's at? You can go all the way around, or if you go through that, that passage through, through the land, right, you can go, and Corinth sits right there at this little four-mile piece of land that separates the west from the Ionian Sea from the Aegean Sea. And so if you don't want to go all the way around to the south, you can cut through. through they, they cut a little passage, so a little like cart thing, so you can just throw your stuff and just slide it on down, and then you just pick it up on the other side, and you go down the trans Isthmian route is what it was called. And so Corinth is what sat right there. And if you control a major trading route, then you can charge fees, right? You can charge for paperwork. And so Corinth had a lot of money, a very powerful city. And so they led the revolt against Rome in the, about 146 BC. And one of the constants of the ancient world is if you try to fight Rome, you lose, right? And so they lost. They lost, and the, the, the city of Corinth got destroyed, razed, brick torn down from brick, salt plowed into the field, just destroyed. Right? 146 BC. A hundred years later, you can go to the next slide. A um, hundred years later, Julius Caesar, smart man, wants to, uh, he wants to be able to charge fees again. He wants to rebuild that city so he can control this trading route. So in 44 BC, he starts to rebuild Corinth. But to have a city, you got to have people. So where do you find one city's worth of people? Well, you're Julius Caesar. You have slaves. You have slaves from all of your travels, all from your, uh, all the, if, whenever you conquer a nation, you take a bunch of people as slaves. You have all the slaves that people have fallen into debt. And so you take all these slaves and you make them a deal. It's a great deal. You're free if you go live in Corinth. Good deal, all right? So you go live in Corinth. Well, the city's been raised and uh, has been destroyed and they, they show up. And how do you make a few bucks at first if you're in a city that's been destroyed? Well, it used to be a rich city, so what's the obvious thing? Grave robbing. Yep, everyone turns into grave robbers for a while, going and getting all the gold out of the ground from the people who try to take it with them. And so this is the start of the city. It started by a, a bunch of, of uh, slaves who are tomb robbing. And that's in 44 BC. And Paul shows up about a century, a century and change later. And so he shows up, and, and the city has started to develop. Right? There is trade that's happening. Some people are starting to get ahead. But it's still very wild, wild west-ish. Right? Very independent, very, I'm in it for myself. Um, it's just kind of a wild and crazy place. And so Paul shows up, and there are some people there who are starting to put together some money. And when you have money for the first time, you're excited, and so you start spending it on things. And you remember that moment when you go shopping for the first time with your first check when you get your first job? I got money! Right? That's what they're like. We have money! And these folks, they're going shopping, right? And so what do they buy? What's the way to show off if you have money? Well, one thing you can do is get fancier food. Right? And so the common people of that day, they ate grains, rice, wheat, uh, fruits, vegetables, and that was it. Right? And, and if you had a little bit more money, you could get maybe a rabbit, a chicken once a year, or something like that, maybe a goat. But if you really wanted to show off, you got beef. Right? That's what's for dinner. You get beef. That's how you show off if you have money. Where do you get your beef? Well, it's the ancient world. And, and there was a, it makes perfect sense once you start thinking about it. It's never what we would expect. But if you want beef, you go to a temple. Because the temples to all the, the Roman gods, Asclepius, the god of, of healing, uh, uh, Apollo, Aphrodite, you go to one of these places where the people have gone and sacrificed an animal to the gods, and once you get done bleeding it out on the altar, what do you, you got a cow. What do you do with a cow? Well, you, you, you butcher it. And so all the temples would have a butcher on staff, because you can't waste a beef, right? And so they would butcher it, and, and then 
they would either sell it or they would use it. And so if you had money, if you were well-to-do and you'd have uh, your birthday party, or you want to have your birthday party for little Timmy, where do you get space to rent it? You go to the temple because the temple has a fellowship hall, much like people rent out fellowship halls today of churches, right? You go to the temple of the sleepiest or whoever, what your favorite god is, you rent some space and they can even cater it. Because they just sacrificed a, a, a cow, right? And so it's like an all-in-one shop. You go, you get the space, and they'll even have the meal for you. It's great. And, and if they anything that they didn't uh, sell catering like that, they would just sell to people who wanted to come by. And so if you want to have beef, you go to the temples. That, that's what you do. So those who didn't weren't able to have beef, what do they do? Well, they just didn't have beef, with one exception. There is one time when if you were poor, you could get a steak. Right? Whenever uh, the, they would have a festival at one of the temples, for a solstice, for a, a harvest festival, for a, a, a whatever, any of the events, they would all have festivals throughout the year and they would sacrifice multiple animals. And if you went to worship that day, you went to church that day, it'd be like hitting the jackpot because you showed up. It's like showing up and having a fellowship meal that you didn't see coming. Right? And so you show up at the temple and they have this festival and we just slaughtered five cows, so how would you like your prime rib today? Right? And so you would show up and to have beef was part of going to temple. And the same way, like if you hear Amazing Grace anywhere else, what do you think? Church, because hymns are worship. Hymns are what you sing at church. In the same way, beef is worship, because beef is what you eat at church, right? Beef is what you eat at temple, right? And, and so, if you're going to worship Apollo, I'd like a when I go to Apollo, I like my Apollo medium rare, and that's just kind of how what people assume that was the assumption they made. This is where it gets interesting, is because Paul shows up and he starts gathering people together for this thing called church. Very new idea, church. Like, hey, Jesus, church! And people start gathering. But they come with very different associations. Right? If I gave you cream de mint brownies, what are they to you? They're good brownies. But to me, they're like solid Christmas. Right? Because we have different backgrounds. If you get a bunch of people together and they have these very different backgrounds, for some of them, having beef was just what you did when you had little Timmy's birthday. And when your neighbor had a birthday for little Susie, you went and had beef there. And where do you get your beef? You get your beef from the temple. Right? And so for the people who show up who want to follow Jesus and they've got a few dollars, they would think of beef as just, eh, have some beef. For those who don't have money, Right? Blue collar, regular working folk, for them to show up and have beef, it's worship of Apollo. And so when they have their, their meals together as a church, because that's what church, some things never change. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to eat together. Right? And so when the church has their, their meals together, some people bring prime rib, other people look at it, right? And you're not going to not have a slice of it, because, I mean, you can't. Isn't it wrong to go through a, a meal, a fellowship meal, and have one's dish? Not ha if there's a dish there that no one's taking a bite out of, that just ain't right. right. So you have to have a bite, right? You have to have some. But for you, you've only ever had prime rib worshiping Aphrodite. Right? The analog that I can make to this is if you have someone over for dinner, whether it's pizza or whether you pull out all the stops, and you pull out a six pack and you serve a beer to someone who's an alcoholic, right? To you, it's just a beer. To them, it's, a, it's to their damnation, right? In the same way, if you show up to, to worship at, at the church and, and I'm just having a steak, but I serve you a steak and that is your worship of Apollo and now you're going to worship a pot. It's, it's a stake unto their damnation. Just as problematic as giving a bottle of wine to someone who, who has struggled with alcohol all their lives. Right? Th that's a problem. This is not about personal preference. Paul is not arguing about animal rights. Animals have the right to be eaten because they're tasty. Right? That's my personal stance on animal rights. But uh, this is a matter of, of, of salvation for people's eternal future. 
And so Paul lays this out rather bluntly. Right? Jesus died on the cross for these folks and you're not going to give up a stake for them? Right? Do not let your liberty become a stumbling block to others. We know that Apollo and Aphrodite are just hunks of stone. But to those who don't, are, are not so knowledgeable, do not let what you know cause them to fall. Paul is saying this because he believes that another's salvation is more important than any one person's preferences. Right? I have my own preferences for food, for music, for etc. And they are exactly that, preferences. And when I don't get my way, I get over it. Being a pastor is one long extended practice in not getting my way. Right? That's just how it works. It, it, it's be, learning to be flexible about everything you can so that you can focus on what is absolutely essential. Salvation. Part of knowing our brothers and sisters in Christ is knowing what for them is a matter of salvation, knowing what is essential, so that when it comes up these certain these situations, we can be flexible, but we also need to be able to name them. This is a matter of, of salvation. Now, we don't know what they did in Corinth because we don't have all their letters. I really do wish we did. But we don't have all the letters. Well, what, what I hope they didn't do is say, well, I'm going to have my stake. Get over it. Right? I hope they did something a little bit different. Maybe the church goes vegetarian. I somehow doubt that. But maybe they did. Maybe those who wanted to bring beef... Maybe they could start butchering it in-house. I mean, it would cost more, but if you butcher it yourself and you bring other people in with it, and maybe you can start, if, if they butcher it themselves, they can see that this is not sacrificed to Apollo. I don't know, maybe they try that. Maybe they just ha have to stop going to these temples and having these meals, and, and, uh, which would be a bit of a sacrifice. But all of these options are based upon what Paul had taught them at the beginning of the letter. Remember, whenever Paul writes one of these letters, he gives them sort of a refresher, an introduction. Right? He reminds them of what we believe together as people who follow Jesus. And so that's what one of the handouts you got today has a list of the six things that Paul wants you to remember from the first four chapters of Corinthians as he goes through, as he's going to talk through all these topics that are at hand in the church. And so he reminds the, he had reminded them that if uh, you follow Jesus in his cross, you're going to look strange to the world. Right? It is with, the, the cross is foolish to the wise, but salvation to us who follow it. And it's for those who are going to not go to their neighbor's uh, birthday party for little Susie, they're going to get asked, why are you doing this? And they're going to have to respond, out of love for people in my church. And then the neighbor is going to ask, What's church? Right? You're going to look weird doing this. But it is out of love for other people of the church. Paul, in the, earlier, at the introduction of the letter, had uh, reminded people that following Jesus was never going to be an abstraction. It was always going to be something we work out together with each other. And that this is another example of this. In some churches, Paul never had to write to Rome or Galatians about steak. He had to write it to about Corinth because that's the people who live there. Church is never done in the abstract. Church is always done with the people who are sitting in the pews with you. Right. People ends the introduction as he ends this discussion of meat, saying, imitate me. Right. This is how he will try, try to convince them. Even if this doesn't make sense to you, just do what I do. You trusted me thus far. Can you just give it a tr Just try it. Just be like I am. Right? Just, just see how it works. This admittedly requires a lot of a church family. Not only are we have, have to be willing to look weird for the sake of another's salvation, we also have to be willing to be open with each other about what it is a matter of salvation. And I must confess that... Uh, I'm not certain how often this arises today. I don't, I mean, the obvious one is if, if you know someone struggles with alcohol, don't give them a beer. Right? We, we tend, that tends to be something we all agree upon. I don't know how much often uh, off other situations of this magnitude arise. Right? It, it, this is not like, I don't like the music they sing at church. Well, that's your preference. Sometimes we sing... Sometimes we sing songs that I don't like but because I know you like them. You know what that is? That's my preference. I get over it, right? And I sing it just as loud as the rest. This is not a matter of preferences. But there are issues that will arise. Um, I have heard uh, people say they won't, can't come to church or won't come to church because they don't feel like uh, they have good enough clothing. Right? It, that's one of the reasons you have never seen me wear anything other than jeans to church. 
I never want anyone to think that they don't have good enough clothing. Just wear something, right? But in general, this seems to be a passage that helps us understand that whenever someone comes to church that we have not met before, they're going to have baggage, and we need to listen to it. Because we, we, are able to see, we seem to be able to get along with each other, but we don't know who the next person to walk in the door, what their hang-ups are going to be. What is for us just stake, and for them, a matter of salvation. The end result of, of paying attention to what Paul lays out here is that we, are, we become a church that is committed to Christ, a place where we are free to be ourselves, to be accepted, welcomed, and loved, and know that when there is a problem of the significance of salvation comes up, we will be heard, we'll be taken care of, and we will be Christ's body being saved. Thanks be to God. Amen.